a dual concert for you here. Yeah. Cool. And hold on. Okay, stairway to heaven. I didn't bring enough for the whole class. Alright. This one's a splendor of
surrounded by your glory. Why will I not feel when I dance for you, Jesus? All in all, you be still when I stand in your presence. Up to my knees, will I fall? Will I sing? Hallelujah. Will I be able to speak it all? I can only.
week that Peter Gates is going to speak at the class? It's scheduled. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, well, Peter's scheduled. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to let that be known. Yeah. Are you going to get to that? Okay. That's okay. That's all right. Good stuff. All good stuff. How y'all doing? Y'all? Yeah, y'all. Uh, that's because I knew where you were. They were in Nashville, Tennessee. We were. Man, a lot. Talk about Bible stuff. Huh? The better question is the short answer. Referred to as the blank of what? 
No, that's not that good. I'll give you the first word, you probably know it. It's the Feast of Tabernacle Unleavened Bread. <laughs> yes, and that's what you talk. So, what a time. <laughs> Alright, so Passover is often referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's because only unleavened bread uh, was eaten during the seven days following Passover. Right. There was holy sweat pain. It was, it was uh, you know, very kosher. So all of the yeast was out, and all of the things like that were taken out of the house, and only unleavened bread was prepared. Passover occurred almost 2,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago, or 4,500 years ago. 35. I hear 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 3,500 years ago. Well, you're referring to Exodus, like going back when they put the lamb over the, um, that was, you know, in my opinion, that was like the first Passover, the blood of the lamb, that was what we're referring to. True or false? There was only one castle. That's true. There's only one Passover. All the Passover since is a memorial. It's a memory of. But there was only one castle, right? Angel of death. And over. Okay. There was only one castle. And in what country did it occur? <laughs> Tennessee, do I hear Tennessee? It was in Egypt. It was in Egypt. All right, now, the reason this introduction is important because what, we, what I want to do here is set the foundation so you really understand and appreciate what's taking place over the last 3,500 centuries. Uh, so let's talk about the historical meaning. Who would like to read that paragraph because it talks a lot about what we talked about as well? Sure. While the Jewish people have celebrated Passover annually since the time of Moses, in reality there was only one Passover. It occurred almost 3,500 years ago down in Egypt. It was there at that time that a lamb was sacrificed and the blood was applied to each doorpost and lentil. When done in faith and in obedience to God's command, that home was passed over by the death angel and the firstborn was spared. All subsequent observances over the centuries were memorials of that one and only first Passover. Okay. Any question? Good. Let's move. Historical meaning. For more than how many years the Jewish people had lived in Egypt? Four hundred. Four years. However, the time had come for God to fulfill his what with who? Covenant. Covenant. His what? Covenant. 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 Covenant with who? Abraham. Abraham. Father Abraham. Remember he said, okay, sweetie, jump in there. I love that. That's who he made the covenant with, wasn't it? And what was that covenant? He would be the father of because, yep, the father of all nations, he was going to give them what? A promise of land flowing with milk and honey. I'd like to get, you know, I love the milk and honey idea, but I, I just soon run into that guy on the motorcycle that has money flying off of him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy to sit behind you. Okay, so, uh, and you can find that in Genesis and read about that and study that. Therefore, God, number three, next page, God raised up one man to deliver his chosen people. Who was that man? Moses. 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 Now, where did, where did that happen? 
let's get off the question just for a second. Where did God meet Moses? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Very good. It was in Mount Sinai. That's not on your questions, but if you want to put a little note to yourself, that's where God met Moses was on Mount Sinai. And how did he meet? Burning bush. bush. And by the way, uh, you can you can find that in Exodus chapter three, verse two. We talked about that. All right, in, in Exodus eleven, God detailed through His servant Moses, that's who we're talking about, the tenth and final judgment plague, which would befall the Egyptians and their so-called gods or deities. What was that tenth plague? Slay of the firstborn. Death of the firstborn. Death of the firstborn. Now, who would like to read number five? Because that explains it more. I will. Okay, Larry. All right. At midnight, <laughs> at midnight, the Lord would pass. This explains the, this explains the plague. At midnight, the Lord would pass through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn of each home where a lamb was not slain and where blood was not applied to the what and what? The doorpost and the lintel. Now, what is the, what, where's the doorpost, where's the lintel? Uh, which one's on the top? The lintel. The lintel. And the post, obviously, the door goes to the college. Do you do that to this day? Because I've had the pleasure of going to an Easter service for Greeks, the Greek Orthodox. And what they do is they believe that the, you know, when the stone was rolled away, the whole church is dark. And the priest comes out from behind the altar with a candle, a bees wrap this candle. And he has the first candle that's lit. And they light every other consecutive candle through there that everybody's there with the one candle. And then each person is charged, literally. You have to carry the light home. That means that you can't drive the car and hold the candle. So if you're on your husband, your husband's driving, you're holding the candle, and you're keeping that light going. And when you get home, you take that candle, and you put the sign of the cross over the door. They're my neighbors. I've gone and done that, and they do it all the time at Easter. And it's very cool because it's so Old Testament. That's just what it reminds me of, and they do. They put it right over the lentil of the door, and then they take the candle inside, and they put it in a little, like, you know, like a candle thing, a holder, and they let the candle burn down until it burns out. That's so Old Testament, but I've actually seen it, and you can see it at the Greek Orthodox Church. Just, you know, just a rabbit trail. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, all right, the effects of this tenth and final plague number six, would even reach the palace. Since the Pharaoh of Egypt was worshipped as a god, a god's son would die. Pharaoh's son would die because of this plague. Uh, some scholars believe that mysterious death was due to this tenth plague. No, he died. He died. You'll find this very interesting. I found it very interesting. Very good. King Tut. Yes. Right. a good guess. <laughs> scholars believe that it's possible, some scholars, not all, that they believe that King Tut's mysterious death was due to the tenth plague. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That is really cool. Huh? Yeah. They also mentioned Elvis, but I didn't buy that one. <laughs> <laughs> With this final climatic plague, God would dramatically set his people free from the bondage of Egypt. Now let's back up for just a second, because I want to make sure we don't miss the impact of what we're talking about. Every newborn would die if what? So this was this was the first what? This was the first blood sacrifice. This was the first blood sacrifice. Hmm. 
Wasn't there a tradition of them sacrifice before that? I'm sorry? Didn't they sacrifice before that? Yeah. Abraham did the sign. Abraham didn't sacrifice, did he? No. He was a good brain. Right. And he got stopped. But there was no tradition to do so? Yeah. Good point. I hold it. This was the first mass. Sacrifice. No, no, I'm teasing. But seriously, I forgot about Abraham and the fact that he was going to sacrifice his son. And of course, that would be placed. But that was an end of the show of faith, wasn't it? If you're going to follow me. And he was what he was received because he prayed. And remember in Abraham's time when Isaac, as we're talking about, if we back up on that, if you recall, they felt they were too old to have a son. So that son was precious to them. And to test him one more time, uh, he told him to take his son, take him to the altar. For, for, uh, 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 didn't he sacrifice a ram? Yeah, and replace yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of uh, Isaac. He was getting ready to sacrifice him and God stopped him. You know, Larry, there's a, there's a program on TV right now. Yes. It's called the Complete Bible. Yeah. And the first the channel. Yeah. And the first part of it was on. And that was really dramatic when he raised the knife. He was going to kill his son because, you know, his wife was young enough to feel screaming because you know, she didn't want her son to die. Right. But, uh, very dramatic. Yeah. It's taken taking you through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Wonderful. And that's a continuing series, I think I heard. Yeah. It's on again tomorrow night. It's the second part. Part two. 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 Roma Downey. Roma Downey. Part of the production. Are producing it and directing it. Or at least producing it. Okay, in Exodus 11, God, God details through his servant, Moses. I hope we already did that. Where am I? Uh, so, in Exodus 12, God outlined in detail the steps to be taken by those who trusted in him so that they, unlike Pharaoh and the Egyptians, would not be struck down by the final plague. On the tenth day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, they were to select a year-old lamb without blemish or spot out from the flock and keep it until the 14th day of the month. Why? No. Read right below it. Exodus 12, 3. Who would like to read that aloud? You got it, Carol? Okay. During this time frame, each family would become personally attached to their lamb, so it would no longer okay. possess an ordinary lamb, but their very own pet. This would deeply impress upon them the costly nature of the sacrifice. An innocent lamb was to die in their place. An innocent lamb died in their place. It's just one of the All that way down. There you go. Because the lamb was supposed to be a perfect lamb, without blemish, without spot. Is that Jesus? Yeah. See, this was the setup. This was the first part of it. And this, and, and I really like the idea how you just didn't get the lamb, you it became your pet, so you appreciated it more. Who has a pet dog? I have four dogs. Four dogs. I would want to sacrifice anyone. Exactly. I mean, if I brought a dog in here and put it on the table and whammy, I mean that would be very disturbing, right? Blood squirting. Oh, nice. And you'd be on the front page sunset. I don't know. I was raised in the country, and when we were just kids, the way we used to kill a hen or a, a chicken is you would uh, put it on the block and you tie and you tie a rope to its legs because uh, you know you whack off the you know one big and the chicken would take off running. The first time I must have been about three years old when that first one we did and I saw that and dad didn't put a rope on it because he really wanted to give the effect to me. And that thing took off running. Blood squirting everywhere running into a tree uh, you know and I, but that's the way they did it. That's the way we did it back then. Sometimes they think that can just you know, 
And then my neighbor, and then my neighbor, you know, they raised hogs, and we would go to the slaughter, and then you know we would we would help with that and go through the whole thing. So I was sort of you're growing up in that era, uh, farm life, country life is uh, is a little different. And so the point being is, if I brought if you brought your pet puppy or dog, and said I want to sacrifice that, I want you to get the feeling it could be a pet dog, it could be a pet cat. Uh, something something that's really, yeah, that really you love. Yeah. And that's what God wanted these people to understand. They really wanted them, that their lamb to be more than just a lamb. They wanted it to be a pet. They wanted them to love it. Like we should love Christ. So when it was led to the slaughter, to the sacrifice, it hurt them more. But they understood that that was the sacrifice to save me. Because I trusted God. And with the blood of that lamb, I put on the doorstep and the lamb. So I might live. Who would, write the, who would write the, like to read the note? You got it? Okay, good. On the evening of the 14th day of the first month, as the sun was setting, the lambs were to be publicly killed by the whole assembly, and then subsequently eaten. Deuteronomy 16:7. None of the animal was to be left over on the following morning. Although collectively everyone was responsible for the death of the lambs, each family was to individually apply the blood of their lamb to the doorpost of their own home as a visible sign of their faith in the Lord. At that moment, the innocent lamb became their substitute making it possible for the Lord's judgment to pass over them. Therefore, the Lord instituted Passover as a night we must observe unto the Lord and bring in them all in the land of Egypt. Okay? Very interesting. Now, we're going to do this. So, when, when the Passover and the atonement for sin was first beginning, you notice that it was one lamb Per what? Family. Then that changed a little bit. We'll, we'll go through the steps. So now let's talk about the service. True or false? God commanded that Passover be observed as a memorial forever. Yeah. True. It's true. Yeah. So if we take that, that's right in Scripture, then who, why would we not want to continue to follow it? See, let me tell you what I believe. I believe, and I'm going to talk for all of us, you want to be an Old Testament historian and a New Testament saint. Because prophecy and the foundation is all in the Old Testament. And Christ is He's through that thread all the way from Genesis, as you've heard Pastor David say so many times, and I thought they were good. All the, way, all the way through Revelation. And so I, I like to say, I want to be a good Old Testament history major, but I want to be a New Testament savior. Because I follow Christ, we follow Christ. Our sacrifice. So I think part of what it is too is maybe people think of it as old covenant, new covenant, and they feel that the new covenant replaced it, so the old one you don't really have to follow or do anymore. And that's a good point. That's one of the reasons some Christians, a lot of Christians, but mostly Jerry or Jerry. I'm sorry, Frank. Terry. I think it's the South Asian. I think it's because they don't understand that they don't study it and they don't appreciate it, so they don't know the Passover story. They just think that's a Jewish thing. Well, it's interesting too because uh, not to wrap up. before tonight, I and if you don't have your computer, you can't do it. But I googled that very thing. Why would Christians want to celebrate Passover? And those are some of the things that came up. Yeah. That you know they feel it's the old, just like. Um, making a home kosher and, and the, all these other things that God set up for the people back then. But that was then, but that's replaced by the new. 
So I think a lot of Christians believe that that's part of that, that we don't have to, you know, celebrate well, that because right. now we have this. Although in the Bible, like it goes on to say, Ram one, or not that it says, but nowhere in the Bible does it say to celebrate Resurrection Day or even Christ's birth. But we are commanded to celebrate these feasts. You know what's amazing? It's um, when I absorbed the Old New Testament and I went back to read the Old Testament after reading the New. It was just like, it was all black and white when you're reading the Old Testament. It's great. But when you go to the Old Testament after reading the New Testament, all of a sudden the Old Testament was like dreary and gray. All of a sudden, boom, it became like technical. Right? Yeah, right. Because prophecy started jumping off the pages Here's and you start connecting the dots from yeah. the New Testament to the Old Testament. You know? Right. The scholar thread. Right. It runs through the whole body. Ah, to yeah. Christ. Yes. All right, true or false? He also, he is who? God. God. <laughs> Declared that it was to be kept by a service. True. 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 That's true. The Passover the number of be kept by a service. Number three, true or false? This service was to be, in, this service was to incorporate the lamb, the matzah, which is what? What's matzah? Oh, bread. Bread. Oh, bread. Oh, bread. Oh, bread and bitter herbs, as well as raise questions in the minds of children so that the Exodus story could be retold from generation to generation. Is that true or false? True. True. That's true. So God's laying this out. By the way, this is God's rules. This isn't us. This isn't, uh, you know, this is what God's telling us. He's telling the people at that time. This needs to be told every year because this was the beginning you mentioned in the Lord. The first glimpse, not the first glimpse, let me take that back. One of the glimpses of Christ working and going to work at that time. Yeah, this interjects something real quick. The matzah was actually made by a Christian. People don't even realize that about the matzah. I don't remember the guy's name, but when you take a matzah and you look at it, you see the stripes as to the stripes of Jesus when he was whipped. And the holes that are in the matzah the is represent when he was pierced. That's right. And that's one of the things that uh, that uh, uh, that is shared when you attend the, the uh, uh, Messianic uh, Passover Seder. It's really good. Yes, ma'am. I'm just saying the regular traditional Passover. You know, you still have the regular matzah. So me, you know, the upbringing, you don't know really that the significance really has to do with the Messiah. Right. right, Eric? I mean, we didn't know what the matzah, it's there. I mean, it's there I didn't traditionally. Know it years. I just put peanut butter on it and I was. Right. <laughs> Judy, where's Judy? Steve. That's all I hear. I would do the same thing. I would ask for jelly. I'm not going to say that. 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 All right. Number four, true or false? The Lord, however, did not detail the order of the service. He only mentioned that it was to be kept. I got some salsies. I got some falsies. I can gather it. That's true. That's true. You read the scriptures. He did not, he did not detail the order of the service. He only mentioned that it was to be kept. Season. <laughs> yeah. I said the season. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Who would like to read the next paragraph? You got it again. Okay. As recorded in Exodus 12, God required priests to follow the foods to be eaten at Passover night: the lamb, matzah, which is unleavened bread and bitter herbs called marrow or in Hebrew. The sacrifice was to be a young lamb depicting innocence. It was to be roasted with fire, portraying the judgment that would befall it instead of their own firstborn. Matzah was to be eaten symbolizing the purity of the sacrifice, since leaven, with its souring characteristic, was often a symbol of sin. That refers to 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. In addition, Bitter herbs were to be eaten as a reminder of the suffering of the lamb. Okay. So that lays it out pretty good. When, when, if you're only applying those three 
Elements. Elements, thank you. That's what I put. <laughs> Those three elements, that's what it refers to. That's what the reference is to. So uh, the young man depicting innocence because it was, it was, it was without spot, remember? It was, it was pure, and, and you could not bring, if you, had it, you went into your flock, or your herd, whatever you call it, I prefer flock, and you see a man, boy, I got a little bit of a mangle, well, but there's one with a little bit of a bad leg, got a bad hip, I'll take this one. Would God approve of that? No, no, the best, the best. Without best blemish. Of, without blemish. Okay. You see, it's representing who? <laughs> Jesus. Showing Jesus. No Absolutely. Okay. So we have the lamb, we have the matzah, and uh, we have the bitter herbs. Now, several centuries before Christ, a somewhat traditionalized Passover service began to emerge. The ritual Passover service was called the same thing. From the Hebrew word meaning what? Order. Order. Now we're getting into structure of the door like you were talking about. So now we're, this is the order. It's prescribed that the traditional order of the scripture readings, prayers, symbolic foods, and hymns in the Passover service. And, and I'm telling you, that's what you're going to see when you come to our Messianic pen. Not only do we have, we have a recording artist. Uh, we have uh, the car back up, we have, I mean, we bring it all, man, we bring it all. We are committed to, much like the, the philosophy of our church, if we're going to do it, we do a five-star, right? right? And that's our commitment to you. <coughs> we're trying, to, and to the people who come, we're, we're, we're doing this on a five-star level. And this year, we're even having Messianic dancers. They're going to be in an outfit, they're wearing a beautiful outfit, and it's going to do it be spectacular. I'll tell you, I, 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 I don't mind telling you this. Uh, I'm great. <laughs> I don't mind telling you this. For a Bible study class, what we do is on a level, and you see this, it's going to be on a level of what I believe a lot of churches with the full effect of everything. Where do you sit? I'm not, I'm not boasting on me, trust me, I'm not. There's a lot of people in this room that are working a lot of hours and they're putting in a lot of uh, effort to, to please our king. This is like our outreach ministry. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Let's bring it all together. The importance. What's the importance? Several important facts must be understood concerning the holiday feast of Passover. First of all, there was only one Passover, as we talked about, in the history of mankind. Only one. This occurred, I, I don't know why I put it even. This occurred when the Lord passed through the land of Egypt, executing judgment. Every observance since then has been a memorial, uh, summary, a memory that occasion. It's in Exodus 13. Okay. Secondly, Passover is an ancient feast, one that spans some 35 centuries of human existence. This holiday forms the primary background for understanding the events of the upper room. What's that referring to? The Last Supper. Last Supper. Supper. The Last Supper. The symbolism of the Lord's Table communion <clears throat> and the meaning of the Messiah's Jesus' death. That's what all of this brings together symbolically and reality. Thirdly, Passover holds great distinction among the religious feasts of the world. Passover is the oldest continually observed feast in existence today, celebrated for some 3,500 years. Even today, more Jewish people keep Passover than any other high holy day. That interesting? It is a strong, cohesive force within the fabric of Jewish community and culture. And finally, Yeshua was crucified during the Passover event. He and his disciples ate at a Passover meal together on the eve of his death. 
During this meal, Jesus said, this is my body. This is the what? what what's been going on here now? The new covenant. What you were referring to, Terry. This is what Jesus said. This is my body. And when he took the bread, he broke it. And he made it in the cup of the, of the wine. So this is my blood. All of the lambs that were sacrificed in Egypt, one per household, pointed to the one true Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You can read that in John 21. Writing to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul noted, for all of time, Christ, our Passover Lamb, is sacrificed for us. Amen. You know what it says right after that? Let us keep the feet yes. Let us keep the feet yes. Now, the, the, the sacrifice starters we talked about, and we probably know the, 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 the way that works. It was one lamb per household, and that became for the atonement itself. <coughs> Correct? Then it became one lamb per nation. So they were just, the, 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 you know, the pastor, I don't know, there were too many people showing up with you know, with lambs. So what they did is when they had the temple, the high priest would take the lamb, remember? And everybody would gather. Everybody would come to Bethlehem. Or where, not Bethlehem. Go back to the burp. <laughs> where, 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 where go to, they would go to, they would go to the temple, they'd go to Jerusalem, and they would come in droves. And if you remember the last week that Christ was on earth, during that week, that was the week he went into the temple. What did he do? He walked with one and a half. Pardon me? He turned over the uh, yeah. money changer. Money changer, man. He went to the temple and they it turned in, instead of a holy place, it turned into, a, you know, a, the flea market. You know what's interesting? Even today, it's the same thing. Well, they have bazaars there. They sell things there. They have, like, big, giant garage sales. I don't know if you know that. No, I didn't know. All right, Rockwell Center, I grew up in Long Island, right? And yeah. the temple right down the road, they had, you know, it was like a big giant garage sale. Man. You know, so. During this time, during the, that week of Passover? Um, I don't know about during Passover, but okay. but the point is, is yeah, that they do, you know, yeah. and they're there to profit to make money, to bring money to the temple. And I could see Jesus walking in there and turning over the tables, you know? Yeah. But it. Okay, so when you take that, so now you have one lamb for the nation. And now it was replaced by who? Jesus. Now you have one lamb for the world. And all you have to do to be saved, just like Moses and that family, when they were in that house, and all the screaming and the crying and the killing that was going on by the the angel of death. Eight minutes? It's 8.40. It's 8.40? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's at Eric's fault. He ran me behind. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Stop me. <laughs> so, the point of is, is then what happened was, just like that family, as I was indicated, when you bow your knee to Christ and you accept him as your personal Savior, see, it's his blood that washed away your sins. And your eternal life is secure. Now I take that a step further. I'm going to tell you something that I don't tell others, and that's this. You can look at it either way. I like to, I, I'm the half full uh, guy. When you say half the glass of water, I'm the half full, not the half empty. So what I like to explain is this. When, Dan, did you accept Christ as your Savior? When? Well, there, I always believed. I can't remember not ever believing in Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. But was there, there a moment? There was a moment when it became real to me. There you go. How many years ago was that? I don't know. Thirty. Thirty years ago. His eternal life started then. See, a lot of people think eternity is after you die. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you started living forever. Forever. You don't have to wait until your physical body is dead because you're spiritually alive. Because you've got Christ in your 
party, and you represent the king, and you got a story to tell. You're already living eternal. Yeah, your spirit, your spirit, and sinful flesh. That's right. So when you, when you know, your best birthday is that second birth, right? When you accept the Christ as your Savior, and right there in the middle, you may not have looked at it that way. You could do the happy dance. I'm going forever. I'm living forever. Jesus Christ, my Savior. I've got him now in my physical presence. I've got him now in my spiritual presence. I'm representing him here on earth. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I will be here. Hallelujah is right. And amen. Okay, let's wrap this up with a song. Because it's so appropriate. We're talking about the Lamb. And, uh, uh, and sing along if you know what he used to say. But uh, praise the Lord because this is a great praise song. Good choice, Larry. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
birthday girl. Thank you. 